What we're going to be going over here are anti-dilution of earnings per share for convertible securities and we're going to look at before and after the inclusion in the diluted earnings per share here and we're going to be looking at bonds and preferable stock. So first starting with our diluted earnings per share for convertible bonds. Now this is where those convertible bonds are going to be converted into common stock. So what we have to do is we have to determine the diluted earnings per share here for those convertible bonds and we go down to our equation here where we would have our net income for the year here. Now we're going to have to add back some interest and then I would be divided by the number of common stock shares outstanding plus those converted shares uh, the, the bonds are going to be converted into common stock. So so let's look at this interest first here. Okay, so let's assume the conversion of, to common stock as of the beginning of the year here for these convertible bonds. Now that would be the case here, you pay no interest on a convertible bonds for the year here. And this net income that we have here shown for the year, that included that interest expense on those bonds. But since those bonds would have been converted, we have to add the interest expense back and it has to be net of taxes because there's a tax effect here on those uh, bonds. Interest is tax deductible and it, it, it causes a, a, that effect here where you have to add back it net of its taxes. Okay, so let's go down and let's do our comparison here. Now let's compare our earnings per share here without those dilutive securities and this is where we're going to add the incremental effect here to the bonds. Okay, so we'll go down to our equation here and maybe we should start out with uh, this before the conversion here. So I've got what I've got it laid out here in our uh, uh, diluted earnings per share here. What we're going to have here for our net income for the year here is 480,000 here and then we're going to have 300,000 common stock uh, shares outstanding here. And that's what we're going to call our basic earnings per share here because we're going to look at that here before we include those um, our uh, convertible uh, bonds in here before we convert them. So before the conversion we're sitting here with simply our net income of 480,000 divided by the uh, average common stock outstanding of 300,000 and we come up with our basic earnings per share here at a dollar and sixty cents. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add in these bonds now at, at, based on their conversion as of the beginning of the year here. So going back we have to add back our interest expense on those bonds because that's interest that's avoided and let's just say we had six million bond, uh, dollars worth of bonds six percent interest rate and for one year that equates to three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So adding that three hundred and sixty thousand dollars back here but we have to multiply times one minus the tax rate. So let's say our tax rate here is 40%. So 1 minus the tax rate, tax rate times that $360,000 because we have to add back the interest here due to the conversion here since we wouldn't have that interest expense outstanding here for the year. The other thing we have to do here is we have to in our denominator we have to increase that denominator or for the common stock that would be outstanding and that's all is based out based as of the beginning of the year here and we're going to increase it here by 90,000 shares. Again we just re to go through it we just had six million here um, worth of bonds and they were a thousand dollar par each times 15 shares. They, let's just say they could have converted those uh, uh, bonds into 15 shares of common stock here each thousand dollar par value bond. That's going to give us 90,000 additional shares here of common stock. Okay so working everything out here starting with our net income adding back our uh, tax exp our um, interest expense for those bonds net of tax here and just remember that net of tax means one t minus the tax rate in this case one minus forty percent and that would have been sixty percent here and then just divide that here by the uh, uh, common stock that would have been outstanding that is outstanding here for the year here 300,000 plus what we added due to the fact that those bonds were converted here of 90,000 shares we come up with our numerator or numerator numerator of 696,000 denominator of 390,000 here and that would equal the diluted earnings per share here of a dollar seventy eight cents for when we included those bonds or we into our earnings per share calculation here for the company. Now this is where this anti-dilutive effect comes in here. So what we have to do is we have 
determining, our, looking at our diluted earnings per share here, when we included that bond conversion, we come up with a dollar seventy-eight cents per share here for the common stock earnings per share. Compare it to what we started with here before the conversion here. The basic earnings per share here was a dollar sixty cents. So it's anti-dilutive here because we had an increase in uh, per share earnings for our common stock here from $1.60 uh, before the bonds were included up to $1.78 here when the bonds were included in our uh, calculating our diluted earnings per share. Okay, so going down here, convertible debt is anti-dilutive. If the conversion of the security causes the common stock's earnings to increase by a greater amount per common stock share than the earnings earnings per share that was before the conversion, and we and that we meant we went over that here. That was that we're comparing it before the conversion. Here we had our basic earnings per share here, dollar sixty cents per share. After the conversion, dollar seventy eight cents per share. So that uh, those. Uh, conversion of those bonds here and uh, is the effect is anti-dilutive here and that's really because there's a greater percent increase here in the numerator up here in a numerator of our equation than in the denominator so if you just mul look at our what we've increased here in our numerator over a denominator that's going to give us an increase a greater increase here uh, and it's going to be anti-dilutive because of those those changes here that we added. We added the extra stock here for the conversion and we also had to uh, sub, uh, bring back or add it back those that interest expense on those bonds. Okay, so we've looked at the effect here uh, for our anti-dilutive effect here and that's based on recomputing the earnings per share here uh, when we added in the conversion of those bonds. All right, so let's go up and let's look at we'll look at some convertible preferred stock here and again our diluted earnings per share here so convertible preferred stock is going to be converted into common stock again we're going to go back to the same equation here that we had for the our our um, bonds that we're using here now with the bonds we have to back, add back some the interest expense because they were uh, converted during the year here or converted at the beginning of the year so we wouldn't have had any interest expense on them. And in the case here of our preferred stock, there's a dividend that has to be paid on that preferred stock. And that dividend expense here would have been included in our year-end net income. But in the case here, we're going to have converted our preferred stock in the beginning of the year here. So we assume we did, we'll have to add back that dividend expense that it was since it was included in our net income. Same as that interest expense that we had to add back in our bonds, uh, we have doing the same thing here for our preferred stock. Okay, so again for our problem here, again assume the conversion to, to the preferred stock to pom, preferred stock, the common stock as of the beginning of the year here and let's just say we had two million here in preferred stock six percent dividend rate here so we have a hundred and twenty thousand dollars expense in our dividend and that that's if it's not converted here but we're gonna convert it and then doing that here our dividend would be zero here because it would have been converted into common stock but the way we work with this here we actually the way the companies do it they don't just don't just say there's a zero dividend here. Uh, well, there would be if that dividend wasn't included in the, it wouldn't have been subtracted out of the net income, but we assume that it was, so we have to add back that dividend here. And again, what we're when we're dealing with uh, preferred stock here, just remember there's no tax effect. With the bonds, we had that tax effect. With the um, preferred stock, no tax effect. So the preferred stock dividend is not tax deductible. That's why there's no tax effect here. And then the preferred stock dividend you add back because that dividend was avoided here. It, may, it was included in our net income so we had to add it back because it was avoided. Okay and then just remember again number of shares outstanding here plus those converted shares of preferred stock into common stock. Okay so now let's go and we'll just compare our earnings per share here for the bonds we're going to work with those uh, earnings per share that we had that were, were included for the bonds that were 
computed previously and add the incremental effect here of the preferred stock. Okay, before the conversion here. Now, you're going to look here. This is what we're dealing with in these examples here. We had that first security here that was converted and this was those bonds here. So what we have to do is we're taking whatever we had for a diluted earnings per share here for our bonds here. Uh, we're going to compare that and we're going to compare that here to what our new diluted earnings per share when we include those preferred stock. Now remember with the bonds here, uh, before the conversion we were just looking at the basic earnings per share here. Now when we're coming in with this preferred stock, we're going back to the last security that was converted. In this case it was those bonds and we came up with our bond earnings per share here of a dollar seventy eight percent that was six hundred ninety six thousand here divided by the three hundred ninety thousand and that was uh, the six ninety six included that add back of the interest here uh, for the year for those bonds and it also included the issuing of extra common stock here for this bond so what we're working with here is we're looking at the last security that uh, we've converted and that was those bonds okay so now for our preferred stock here again we're going to start with our net income here. That was where the after the bonds were calculated here. And then we're going to have our uh, common stock outstanding here, or shares of common stock outstanding. Again, after those bonds were converted here, 390000 And our net income here starting at 696000 Now for our dividend here in our preferred stock. So our dividend avoided here is 120000 here in dividends. We would add that to the net income here uh, with the, that bond conversion of 696000 And then for our common stock addition here because those preferred stocks were converted into common stock we have 40,000 here and let's just say we had those two million dollars worth of preferred stocks here a hundred dollar par each times they could be converted into two shares here common stock so that would be 40,000 shares here common stock so what we've done here we've I uh, had to add back that dividend that was avoided because these uh, preferred uh, stocks were converted at the beginning of the year and then we wouldn't have to pay any of that dividend here. And then we added the equivalent number of shares of common stock that those preferred stocks were uh, were converted into common stock. So here we're going to come up with the diluted earnings per share here based at a dollar ninety cents per share. That's our recomputed earnings per share here. And what we do here is we can Compare it to that bond, our bond earnings per share here of a dollar seventy-eight cents per share. So you can see our we've increased it by taking and adding those preferred stocks here to what we had in our bonds. The diluted earnings per share increased to a dollar ninety cents per share, and that is anti-dilutive here. That would be what we're looking at as anti-dilutive. So since the rec recomputed earnings per share here is increased here from uh, to dollar ninety cents per share here from a dollar seventy eight the effect of the preferred stock is anti-dilutive okay so we've had our bonds we showed those were anti-dilutive and also our preferred stock was anti-dilutive and the rule is here if the convertible securities have an, have an anti-dilutive effect after recomputing the earnings per share here the security would not be included in due determining the company's diluted earnings per share. So what I went through here in this example, I we looked at these securities where in, and we did a comparison before and after their conversion. And what we had, we had would take whatever our earnings per share were before the conversion and we started out with our basic earnings per share here for the bonds. And then we added in the effect of what the bond conversion would. We have added some interest for the bonds and then we also had to add in our denominator the additional increase here in our shares issued for those bonds that are converted. And then after taking that figure and figuring out our diluted earnings per share for the bonds, which we have up here, I'm showing it, uh, what we have here for our bonds, then we took and we compared that earnings per share here after our bonds were included to the diluted earnings per share here after the preferred stock was included. So here we put in the bonds and then we added that incremental effect here for the preferred stock for the uh, the preferred stocks, con convertible preferred stocks 
effect here increase or had to add back the dividends that was avoided and we had to increase the number of shares here the common stock that were outstanding and then we did that based on that we come up with our diluted earnings per share here but again we always go back and we look at what we had previous here what we had in previously converted here and in that in this case we were working with that convertible bond here and then we compare it to what we're currently working with here that preferred stock and if you see an increase here from what we had previous to what our new diluted earnings per share would be here then the security that we're working with here currently that is anti-dilutive and if it's anti-dilutive then the companies wouldn't include that in their earnings per share but I just wanted to go through here and discuss how companies deal with and determine this anti-dilutive effect here now you could go back here and you could see where it may not be anti-dilutive if you start playing around with your numerator and your nom denominator you'd have to uh, for example here maybe you'd have to have a whole lot of extra shares issued here and you'd have a very small dividend reduce your dividend by a whole lot and then you can see that the effect here you're really looking at that new comparing that numerator and that denominator on the what the the effect that they would have here uh, when you do your divisions here so you can go back and look at it that way so you, that'll give you an idea here when we're talking about anti-dilutive had we come up with the fact here that let's just say for this example our diluted earnings per share here would have been like a dollar fifty cents per share here and we had comparing it to what we had with our bond here at a dollar seventy eight cents per share um, then it would have been dilutive it would have been dilutive this uh, preferred stock here but that's what we in this case it wasn't it was increased therefore we call it anti-dilutive okay so that's just a summary here and how you would deal with uh, uh, convertible securities here and how companies look at it when they have to determine whether or not the security is dilutive or anti-dilutive and they're comparing it from in steps here where they have to recompute their earnings per share here based on each one of the securities now that becomes an involved topic and it's really a special topic all I really wanted to talk about here is this anti-dilutive effect here and how you would go about looking at it in terms of in this case just two securities that we worked with